Welcome back to the Side Chat Podcast. This week we will be covering British aircraft armament. Firefly is back with us to finish this up. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this will be primarily, most of the time, will probably be spent on some kind of British oddities and on the 20mm Hispanos, which I know for a lot of people there's kind of confusion because there's... Well, there's uh, you'll see Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 5 in game, and what are the differences and whatnot. Um, to start with, you're going to hear us... In the game, you'll see when you hover over the British guns, it'll say 77 millimeter. We're going to call that British 303 throughout this podcast, so if there's any confusion, the 7.7 millimeter is the British 303. A uh, little backstory on the British 303, it came around the late 1800s, and it basically helped the British capture half this fucking planet. Um, they chambered almost everything in it. It was a... It was a round that was ahead of its time, and the British... One of the great things about British uh, engineering was that Typically, when they built their weapons, it was thinking about the soldier first. How can the soldier put more rounds down target? How can the gun be more uh, comfortable? How can they, you know, reload the gun faster and uh, whatnot? So, um, British 303 was a marvel for its time. By the time World War II rolled around, though, the uh, U.S. 30 cal and the uh, German 7 millimeter kind of surpassed it in ballistics and whatnot. But the British were still hanging on to it because it was the best they had. Um. So I guess we'll start with the Nimrod's gun, which is a... It's called the Vickers E-Machine Gun. That's a kind of a variant of the Maxim machine gun that we saw in the Russian tree last week. That Vickers built under license. It was lighter. Um, and I actually don't know what else to say about it really that much. It, it was, They were serviced together with the Maxim. The British used the Maxim and the Vickers because they needed their hands on any gun they could get for over one. That is true, although there is one thing that I need to clarify. The Vickers Company purchased the Maxim Company outright in the late 18th, 19th century, uh, which meant that they didn't have to make the gun uh, using a license. But oh, they just bought they, them, okay. Yeah, they, they simply bought the entire company with all the intellectual property. That makes it easy enough. So, and I guess real quick, the when we mention 303s, at least what I found in game, is you want to go with the 303s will tear apart biplanes and any type of structurally weak planes with no problem. When you get to later aircraft like the 109s and the 190s and anything that has basically any modern type of metal on it, um, the 303s had a hard time kind of punching through that. So your best bet is the anything that has incendiary on it trying to light those gas tanks and engines on fire and, and for War Thunder uh, the 303s I think personally have the highest chance of lighting anything on fire from what I've seen besides the 50 caliber APITs well I would also consider the Russian API rounds to be very effective uh, however you have to consider that in real life um, after some ballistic tests have been conducted by the British uh, armaments officers they actually concluded that a 303 round fired from a Browning machine gun which we'll get to in a minute uh, has a one in a five uh, chance of lighting a fuel tank of an aircraft on fire provided that it doesn't strike any armor along the way. So, essentially, if you had a gun which fired very fast, like the Vickers didn't, actually, <laughs> it was only the Browning which fired as fast uh, as, as was required, you would have a high chance of actually setting the, the, the target to light. However, problems occurred when uh, those rounds actually struck a bigger object than a typical fighter, not canvas, not with canvas, but with lots of metal. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute, and this is also the reason why the British have finally abandoned the 303. But that is, uh, well, post-1940 discussion. Then the next gun you'll see in the tree is called the Vickers K. So we have the Vickers Z, and then there's the Vickers K. The Vickers K was a much more modern machine gun. You'll see it has this huge, like, dish saucer on top that hold. I think there were 60 and 100 round uh, magazines that were easier for gunners to change and bombers because your ammo is self-contained. You just, you know, it's easier to change something that's on top than under, you know, fiddling with something underneath. Um, these things had a massive high rate of fire. Uh, is there anything you want to add about the Vickers K? 
Uh, yes, it was a complete departure from uh, the previous guns that Vickers actually built. Uh, the water-cooled Vickers E and all its predecessors have actually been classic guns, as you said, very similar to the Maxim uh, that it was uh, intended to follow on. Uh, and the Vickers K was a gas-operated weapon with a high rate of fire, as you said, depending on the variant, it was between 1,000 and 1,200 rounds per minute, still firing the famous British 303 round, uh, and uh, it, it was actually a very good and very reliable weapon. And in addition to being mounted on planes, it was actually used uh, with, by ground forces, uh, in particular the SAS and the Long Range Desert Group, which <laughs> mounted it on in twin mounts on their vehicles uh, and did hit and run raids on uh, German airfields in North Africa. Uh, and what the Brits did, did find out was that uh, the construction of the gun actually made it very reliable in sandy environments, uh, more so than the Browning. And uh, although the Browning was used just as often as, as the Vickers, the Vickers was actually the preferred the preferred gun for that very use. And uh, it was actually a likable gun. Its uh, drums had a big capacity of between 60 and 100 rounds. It didn't have the flexibility that a belt-fed Browning gave you. However, once the, the, it actually worked properly and you learned, you, you learned how to change those drum mags quickly, you could actually increase the rate of fire significantly compared to other guns of the same caliber. Overall, a very good weapon of its caliber and a very good weapon of its class. I was going to mention the SAS. I'm going to include a picture too when we talk about it. And, uh, mentioned that the SAS, and I'll, I love this, I wish Ground Forces had this thing. I know it has no point and it can't kill anything in Ground Forces, but I just think it'd be hilarious to drive around what's called the SAS Battle Jeeps. And they were used also in late war. You talk about a bunch of badasses. They would go into, uh, I think they were actually dropped by glider or uh, airlifted in, and they would r basically roll up on a German convoy of um, infantry and water, fuel, ammo, just drive up and down either in a ditch or in the woods, just shoot the living hell out of as many vehicles as they can and then drive back off in the woods. And then the Germans go chasing them for days trying to find these, you know, assholes who keep shooting up their convoys and these little jeeps. Yep, um. that's true. And <laughs> those guys were actually responsible for Hitler giving the order to shoot all commandos on site and not to give them the protection from uh, the Geneva Convention. Yeah, they were they treated as spies. They were war criminals and not as, uh, as combatants, you know, <laughs> as regular soldiers. And the Nazi officers who gave those orders got hung for that too. So justice came full circle on that whole story. Yep. So, um, after the Vickers K, we have the Browning 303, which is the ubiquitous gun mounted on almost every single British aircraft known to man. Yep, and uh, I guess long story short, it's about, I guess you could say, 90% the same thing as a Browning 30 caliber that was rechambered for 303. And the only massive difference that the British did was they did what's called a open bolt design, which, real quickly for those who don't know what open bolt is, um, we've mentioned it with the Mark 108 was an open bolt. Um, the firing pin is actually held on the back of the bolt, and so when you pull the trigger, the, the bolt stays open. And when you pull the trigger, the bolt will slam forward, putting the cartridge in and firing, and then will go back to the open position versus the bolt being closed, firing the round and then opening to load the next one and then closing. It's a lot less moving parts, and it's easier to uh, manufacture. The downside is, is that you have an open bolt sitting there to collect dust and any other foreign objects that want to get in there. And you can't, it's not, you can't put them through prop hubs because you can't synchronize, uh, it's hard to synchronize the guns together. And so these things kind of just rat off rounds as they want because it's, they're, you know, I'm trying to say, it, it doesn't have the, uh, um, I guess, coordination to fire all those at when you pull the trigger. You have a mechanical delay. Yeah, and this is what you're going to see uh, in later fighter designs, that those Brownings are mostly wing mounted in batteries of two, three, four, or even six. And, uh, you know, as the RAF tried to look for a stopgap solution that could, uh, in effect, increase the effectiveness of their armaments despite the low killing, killing capacity of the 7.7 .7 round, uh, you'll notice that the, the numbers in, of, of, the, of guns increasing many times over. And like I said, with 7.7s, the British 303s, I've always found best is, you know, use the uh, 
and this fact to be actually the tracer belts which is sometimes frowned upon I always found that I just go for fires with these things because um, there's been times in games where I can unload thousands of rounds into a target and not get a kill you just have to go for those lucky gas tank uh, fires um, like Firefly said though the British like everybody else kind of had problems building a legitimate 20 millimeter cannon and the British long term goal was to get to that 20 millimeter armament but they we'll get to that in a minute with the uh, Hispanos but the 7.7s were always included on the Spitfires or anything else as a kind of fallback weapon for when the larger armament failed. Especially because the, the Hispano wasn't initially known to be a very reliable weapon and well, some people led, it led some people to say that it jammed as often as as it fired, but that is a bit of, a, of an overstatement, uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. The next thing you'll see, and I guess let me pull out the Spit 16 would be a good point for this, the uh, Browning M2s, and from the research I could find, I was trying to find this, not 100% positive, so... But it's the same 50 caliber round that the U.S. used on every plane they produced for the most part. Uh, I believe they were lend lease, which means that the British, to my knowledge, didn't actually build them in England. They were all shipped over from the States and then installed on aircraft from there. That's true. Um, so this was kind of a replacement to the 7.7s later on. And you'll see that in later war planes, before they actually started mounting four Hispanos in planes, you'll see that, uh, in, in, on Spitfires in particular, you'll see two Brownings, uh, as, you know, right next to Hispanos, and there were there were many reasons for that. The first one was, as you said, that the Brownings were actually a fallback weapon, which in case of a you know, of a jam of of a Hispano would be used to fend off any opponent, opposing aircraft. Uh, there was also the reason of uh, that the Hispano itself uh, was a gun designed primarily for engine mounting from the get-go. And even though the British actually designed the his started designing their own version of the Hispano in 1936, it actually took them quite a while to design a reliable weapon uh, which was, uh, you know, measured in imperial, not metric, and which uh, could be mass-produced by any factory uh, to, to mount an aircraft. Uh, and the thing about the engine mounting of the Hispano is that the engine block of an aircraft, which is usually a very heavy cast iron, iron part, um, it's actually a very rigid way to mount a cannon. And you'll see that Mark Berkeley, the genius behind behind the HS-404, which is, was the base, the original name of the cannon, uh, actually designed it with this very purpose in mind. And uh, you'll see that in planes like the D-520 uh, or the MS-406, the French uh, fighter aircraft, you'll see this cannon mounted in the V of the engine block. However, in planes like the Spitfire, due to space constraints and other 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 reasons, uh, the cannon could not be mounted in the V of the engine block. Uh, th this was, I think, mostly due to the way that the, the Merlin was built. And you'll see that um, the Hispano was mostly mounted in the wings. Well, universally mounted in the wings, uh, which made for a relatively unstable mounting. And this is, was one of the primary reasons why the Hispano was initially so unreliable and so prone to jamming. Uh, simply because it didn't have a strong enough mount. And the British did many things in order to rectify this. Uh, they actually laid the gun on the side, uh, they tried to strengthen the, mount the mountings and so on and so forth, but in the end they actually had to do some design revisions to the gun itself in order to ensure that it would be reliable enough for mounting in aircraft wings. But we'll get to that again in a minute. You'll see that the many variables and the many variants of the Hispano Mark I, from Mark I to Mark V are designed with wing mounting, uh, primarily with wing mounting in mind. And you'll see that through these progressive up uh, updates, the British have actually designed a cannon which was very, very good. Yep, the Hispano, we'll start with the Hispano Mark I. Yep. Which was very early war. It was um, primarily used on the bow fighters. The yeah, early... Primarily used on the bow fighters, where it didn't uh, give as many problems as in Spitfires, because as you, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, the bow fighters have a battery of 20 millimeter Hispanos 
in the nose section of the uh, under the nose section of the aircraft, which means that uh, the the cannons themselves don't move around that much, and they actually have a rigid mounting. And because the uh, because the second crew member could actually operate these guns in in case of a stoppage, uh, they were actually pretty reliable. And also, there was one problem that you know became evident once the gun gun was actually mounted on the bow fighter it was that the original gun was designed to be drum fed using a 60 round drum and because uh, the in, in night fighter operations you needed to have as much ammunition as you could simply because you couldn't see the target clearly enough and you simply had to have as much ammunition as you could in order to ensure that you would kill the target and uh, for this reason the Hispano has actually been improved and uh, modified to take uh, to take to be belt fed instead of being uh, drum fed because in the event that the ammunition ran out in the bow fighter the second crew member actually had to manually reload the drums and change the drums in order to ensure that the pilot had to something to fire with um, and that was the first and primary modification and with additional uh, additional reliability upgrades this resulted in the Hispano Mark II cannon which we'll get to in a minute uh, but again the Hispano Mark I drum fed 60 rounds per gun uh, initial version converted over from the HS-404 and thus the closest to the original Mark Bickett's uh, project. Yep, one thing I want to quickly talk about the uh, bowfighter. The actual crewman had to kind of climb underneath there. And the, I've read some stories of kind of tales of the uh, poor guy had to reload these. Typically, the bowfighter was never flying in level flight. It was rolling and pitching and, of course, you know, either being taken fire or in a dogfight or, you know, trying to fly evasively. So you're not on a flat surface. You're on a moving surface, and it's pitch dark. You're moving around hot shells and hot guns trying to reload this thing. So it was an absolute nightmare for the guy who had to reload the gun and fly. And then 60 rounds, that's kind of the problem that the Germans had with the MGFF. 60 rounds per gun is uh, nothing. Yeah. Uh, this is just just too little. Well, with the MGF-50, it wasn't as much of a problem because although the guns, uh, y you know, with a single-engine fighter, you wouldn't be able to change the gun, to change the ammunition anyway. So, w when you were done with ammunition, you simply had to go home. A bow fighter was expected to stay on the battlefield for much longer than a typical single-engine fighter, simply because of the nature of the of, of the tasks that were, it, they were, it, mm, that were given to it. So. In order to ensure this, you know, long-term operation, this poor fellow actually had to do exactly what you said. That is, operate in the pitch black, and you know, try to try to make do with um, with what he had. And then the other planes that the Mark One was installed on. Let's look at this bit Mark Two uh, B. Yeah, the Mark Two B, and also uh, some uh, Mark Two Bs were actually employed during the Battle of Britain. However, the gun itself actually came a little too late to see widespread service. The very first widespread ap application for Spitfires for the Hispanos was the Mark V, and that was the Mark V B, with the B-type wing, as the name suggests, uh, which housed again Mark One Hispanos with 60-round drums. And the other fallback you'll see, these guns, and a lot of people I've seen post in the forum say these guns jam way too much in game. Well, from the research I found, they these things love to jam in real life. One of the main problems they had was these guns, like Firefly was talking about, the mounts were strong enough. And every time this plane, if you tried to shoot when the plane wasn't level, you had a high chance of jamming it. So, you know, it's like anytime you want to pull shots off of a spano, you had to make sure you're in level flight to make sure, you know, to give the guns the best chance of... Uh, not jamming, so that's why the Bowfighter Mark C Six a few patches ago just started jamming like nonstop, and you know the Hispano Mark Ones weren't uh, as reliable as I think most players would have liked, and I think that's, that's true. more realistic that they jam because from what we could see, you know, they that's what they yeah, did. Yeah, and as for pure numbers, I think uh, the Hispano actually had the reliability rate of about 50% of what the M2 Browning did. Now, while the M2 Browning was known to be a very reliable gun for its time for an aircraft gun, uh, the Hispano wasn't. And I mean, half the time, uh, it would just simply jam, you know, in midair without doing anything in particular, just when you wanted to fire off a shot, and then, boom, the gun 
simply stopped working and, and went silent. So that was actually a very big problem with the with the initial Hispanos. So um, you can probably imagine that the British engineers actually had to scramble to uh, to rectify these problems, and they did eventually. So real quick, let's before I move on to Mark II, ammo belts they're gonna pretty much stay the same, I believe, for the most twenty millimeters for the British. For yes, do, yeah. planes like the Spitfire Mark II B or the Mark IX, I typically stick with universal belts personally. Um, I really like the HEFI and the HEF uh, SAPI um, rounds. They seem to, at least for me, work the best. And then if you you can switch to ground target, the Hispanos have a pretty decent armor piercing capability. You can take out medium tanks at pretty close range. You can take out pillboxes, so you can farm ground targets with most of these. Uh, the Spinal Mark 1s and Mark 2s. We'll get to the Mark 5 later on. But Mark 1 and Mark 2s are very good for farming ground units, depending on what ammo you put on. And also, before we set off and talk about the Mark 5s, just one word of uh, about the history of the ammunition belts used for these gun guns in real life. Now, uh, at first, the, the, these, these guns mostly used high explosive rounds and also practice shells simply because there was a shortage of uh, true armor piercing shells and th these were depending on depending on which squadron uh, you had your plane in and uh, you know on, on the exact moment that you had your guns um, the fir most of the first uh, shipments of uh, hispano belts actually had uh, practice shells in them. Uh, that actually changed from 1941-42 onwards when the armament was standardized to be uh, half of the ammunition to be high explosive fragment uh, incendiary, not high explosive fragmentation but high explosive incendiary, and semi-armor piercing. Uh, that was basically I think an HE shell that had um, a delayed action, not, not a delayed action fuse but uh, just an, an armor piercing component in it and uh, this was the standardized uh, ammunition belt for all, the, for all the planes and also a word on the HEI ammunition. The initial the initial shipment of the HE ammunition actually caused, uh, because of the, the way the fuse worked, it actually caused the shell to detonate prematurely and to damage the skin of the aircraft and not the actual internal components that were important to the operation of the aircraft. So, uh, from 1942 onwards, a shell was designed that actually had the delayed action fuse and did carnage inside of an aircraft. Simply because of the ballistics of the Hispano, it, would, it was able to penetrate a lot of armor and a lot of uh, and a thick-skinned aluminium. And uh, this is actually, um, you know, a, a very a very peculiar way of destroying an enemy aircraft. Because if you notice, for example, the German cannons, they mostly relied on chemical energy or high explosive potential uh, to destroy an enemy aircraft. The Hispanos were actually a bit of a compromise. It was I would actually say that half of the destructive potential was provided by ballistics and the other half by chemical components. And you can see that quite clearly when you see diagrams of these shells, uh, section of shells, um, of, uh, of how much the high explosive component actually did. Uh, it wasn't as much as in German cannons, but that was simply a different approach. And uh, it has to be said that uh, with that compromise in mind, the, the Hispano shells were actually very effective at knocking down both lightly and heavily. Uh, armored targets, uh, you know, aircraft wise. And real quick for the bow fighter Mark VI, I want to add um, I switch between universal and stealth. If there's any play, ever a plane to use stealth ammo on, it's the uh, bow fighters because we got four cannons that shoot pretty much straight on, and you will demol demolish ground targets and air targets. The air targets is funny because they don't know where you're, you know, they don't know you're shooting at them until their plane crumbles apart behind them, but. Uh, I, I, you know, if you stick with the stealth rounds on the bow fighters, I think you uh, ultimately will get some enjoyment out of it. Yep. And then we're on to the Mark II uh, Hispanos, which you'll see in game real quick. You'll see it says in the tech tree 1942 and 1943 for some planes. Um, that's just you'll see it's just a reliability thing. I don't believe it actually makes much difference except for a much less failure rate, but for the most part, they're the same gun. I couldn't find anything on the internet um, saying there was a huge difference between 1942 and 1943 produced. You know, it wasn't some uh, magical thing they did, I guess. Yeah, well, some magical things and, you know, 
Gaijin Vodka Logic and so on. But uh, I would actually, well, the biggest difference between the Mark One and the Mark Two is, as we said, the fact that uh, the Mark Two was belt fed and it used a disintegrating link belt, metal belt, uh, that, you know, is a common feature among all British aircraft. And this doubled the ammunition capacity from 60 to 120, and you'll see that from the Mark V C Spitfire onwards. The Mark V C actually used a neat new type of wing called the C wing, and uh, as the name suggests, and also um, you'll see that uh, you know each of its cannons has 120 rounds of 20 millimeter 20 millimeter rounds available to it, and the 5B has uh, 60 60 per gun. Uh, so that is a massive difference. It's you know four times the, the amount of ammunition. 20 millimeter ammunition that you have in the Mark 5C over the Mark 5B, and it really makes for a huge difference. And then, a little side note before we uh, jump onto the Mark 5s. About this time, the British uh, they were very good at manufacturing, but of course they were constantly under attack and rockets and bombs and whatnot. So they were wanting to rely on the U.S. for as much manufacturing as possible, and they were really looking forward to the U.S building their Hispanos, which I believe the uh, Mark II US cannon was, I guess, comparable to the Hispano Mark II, or if not even the same thing. Um, mm, I, could, I, I can't I'm not entirely sure find well. diagrams, but but US manufacturing, as I talked about in the original podcast for the US arm, it sucked, so the British were able to eventually meet the, you know, the numbers they needed to produce these guns themselves, because they, uh, I think they real quickly learned on, they work an account on the US to build a gun that was reliable. And then yep. we get to the Mark V which is in a lot of ways a completely different gun than the Mark I or the Mark II. Mm, that is entirely true and it's a well okay well if you look at the way that the gun works it's actually a pretty similar gun however you will notice that if you put a Mark II side by side with a Mark V you will notice that the Mark V is actually a shorter gun. And the reason for that is uh, they simply cut off the end of the barrel and made it shorter in order to uh, to decrease the stress on the gun and increase the, the rate of fire. Because they've noticed that although the Mark II had very good ballistics, with very little concessions you could actually make the Mark V to fire much faster, fire the same rounds with acceptable ballistics, and yet... Uh, increase the destructive potential of the weapon simply by increasing the number of shells flying around in in the air at any given time. They also chopped off the, I forgot what the mechanism to call, but the, the original Mark I and Mark II responders are huge because they have this mechanism in there too that's like a, it allows the gun to be uh, cocked and decocked during flight. And they actually removed that from the weapon too to lighten it up and to make it smaller. So you these guns couldn't be charged uh, through the cockpit for what what I could find anyway. I don't know if that's uh, what you know or. Yeah, that is exactly true. They had they actually had to be cocked uh, on the ground by the mecha by the mechanics. And the main thing about this is we're starting to get into the you know Tempest Mark IIs, the Tempest Mark Fives, uh, the jet age of aircraft, and you don't want these long barrels sticking out of your wings because that creates drag, and you know you want top speeds and aerodynamics. So having the guns almost flesh against the wing was a huge deal. But like you said, there's less muzzle velocity, which the Mark V's have less punching power to ground targets, but um, these things rattle off 20 millimeters like no tomorrow. And I have the numbers here just as a quick comparison. The Mark I Hispano fired 600, 700 rounds per minute. The uh, Mark V's fired 750, so at the low point, the Hispano's fired 600. You're getting about 150 rounds more a minute, and then the they lost about 30 meters a second off the uh, velocity. Yeah, and uh, uh, considering that you have four of these guns mounted in the wings, that is a huge loss. And they also fixed the, so this was you know the they put these things on, literally everything. You'll see them on the meteors, on the vampire, and so on and so on. So this is you know. I guess the end game for the uh, British tech tree yeah. for cannons. And you can tell that in game, these cannons, once you're at convergence, these cannons are devastatingly effective. I think they are, well, they are my favorite guns to fire simply because of the predictable way the shell travels and also because you simply have 
the, the gun simply fires so fast, and the Tempest Mark V actually has so it's such a big ammunition load, 800 rounds, that um, it really it really makes a difference. And then we will jump to a real quick note on a plane that kind of irritates me. That's in game. Um, <laughs> and I'll get that is? the the Vickers P Tempest. Um, yeah. Uh, and this is one of those things that War Thunder Gaijin, the team at Gaijin, wants to put every plane in the game. And the Vickers P, I guess, is the statement that shows that. Because why I say this, I searched high and low on the internet for this Vickers P. I've read on some British sites about some stories. I've looked on a couple other historical sites. And so combining all the information together, this cannon you see right here was never put on anything else. Um, wasn't used for the ground or anything. The shell was, but the gun itself was a prototype. And yeah, it never went it into production. Yeah, the Class P gun, uh, which was the full name of the project, was initially conceived in, uh, I think, late 1942, after the the Tiger tank was introduced in uh, Tunisia. Uh, and the Mark II D uh, Hurricanes, which were equipped with the Class S Vickers guns, the 40mm guns, uh, actually had trouble penetrating the Tigers. Uh, so uh, the initial... The initial um, uh, the initial qualification for the gun was for it to have 75 millimeters of uh, armor penetration to fire at about 800 rounds per, uh, meters per second and about 60 rounds per minute with not less than 60 rounds stored in uh, in the plane and that was to be mounted on a general purpose fighter aircraft such as for example the hurricane mm, and there were three variants d delivered by uh, three different companies. The first one was provided by Vickers, the second one was provided by uh, Rolls-Royce, and, and the third one, the chief superintendent of the armament design and the war office. And the, only the Vickers gun actually came to fruition and was mounted on an aircraft. <laughs> However, it was only ever mounted on a single aircraft, a single Hawker Tempest, uh, number SN854, and was trialed, I think, uh, but was never <laughs> put into production. Uh, because first, it wasn't needed. Secondly, the RP-3 rocket, the 3-inch rocket, will, which we'll cover later, um, actually replaced most of these guns, uh, most of these guns on the surface, despite being a relatively inaccurate weapon. And although the Vickers P gun was not a bad one, it was al already an, a very old idea of how to kill an enemy tank using... using an aircraft. So uh, that project never came to fruition and it was only tested and well what you have in uh, in game is basically a pre representation of that. Yep, it's the same plane from the picture. The two stories I could find online from two different sources is one that the one story is is that this plane they literally mounted the guns on the plane, took the picture, went this is stupid, ripped the guns off, put the 20 millimeters back in the wing and sent the thing on its way and there's some records of this plane serial number actually hitting service at, and the squadron so this plane didn't even keep those cannons that long um, the second one is that they took it up they flew it they hated it and then it went back into service so uh, to my knowledge these things were even fired uh, off the airplane or they didn't do any, any field runs it literally maybe went for one flight hated how it felt and then back on it then then scrapped the project so um, if you didn't hear about the Vickers P Tempest and, you know, from your history books or, you know, you're like, you know, I I've never heard of this plane, don't feel bad because I don't think most most historians have either for the most part. Yeah, it that's true. It wasn't a difference maker at all. Then we have the Mosquito that came in 1.39, the, uh, I guess that'd be the Mark... FB Mark 18, 18. say. And there's, um... We'll get to the cannon first, but this is the only plane that this was this gun was put on. Um, the purpose of this plane was to be a U-boat hunter, which there's no U-boats in game. I'm gonna make a video about this plane in the next week or two. I'm still trying to get some footage, still trying to test it, and it's frustrating. But this plane should have more armor on the front and underneath because it was meant to take flak fire from the U-boats. I don't think that's mauled in yet. And the purpose of this gun is it could actually kill a U-boat that was under was it two feet or two inches or two feet of water? I think I have that in my notes. Uh, two feet of water. Two feet actually. of water, yeah. Um, which is actually 
water does hell on ballistic, so to have that much force to move two feet of water and then through steel is very impressive penetration. The 57 millimeter is essentially just a six pounder, what the British call a six pounder gun. Yeah. Um, and where the mul name Mullins come from is they took a six pound artillery piece and then there was a Mullins auto loader, so that's why it's known as the 57 millimeter Mullins. The Mullins has to do with the auto loader attached. I'll put a picture of that on the uh, video as well. And there was only about, I don't know, 40 of these airplanes built, and it was replaced by the RP-3 rockets, which we'll get to soon, as he mentioned, because they did a much better job and allowed for a lot more versatility. That is exactly true. Well, the six-pounder gun uh, actually began life as an anti-tank gun to replace the two-pounder gun, which was found to be inadequate in about 1942 onwards. It, it simply couldn't penetrate enough armor, and uh, it was supposed to be replaced in service by the six-pounder, which was a 57 millimeter, also used by the U.S. Army. Uh, U.S. Army, and the Molins Company, the Molins Machine Company, to give it its full, its full name, it was actually a company which specialized in making cigarette packets. <laughs> now. How a company which made cigarette packets actually went on to produce auto loading uh, mechanisms for six pounder guns, I don't know. Well, it's the same uh, plane that was built by furniture makers, so I mean, you know, it's just the whole, whole project yeah. was meant by people who didn't know anything about aviation for the most part. That's true, although <laughs> it was designed from the ground up to be built by, you know, the grassroots industry that you had in, the, in Britain. You know, it was Geoffrey de Havilland designed it with this specific purpose in mind. But no matter. Uh, the six-pounder gun, uh, as you said, was a hell of a gun for, a, for an aircraft. I don't think any heavier gun was ever mounted on a British-made uh, aircraft that actually made it into production. And the six-pounder, as you said, uh, was a very good gun for the purpose. And one more note about the U-boats. Um, the thing about the U-boats was that it's not only uh, it's, it was not only about uh, the amount of water that the shell could travel and then penetrate the armor of the of the U-boat. Uh, the U-boat itself wasn't actually armored in any way, as far as I know. However, especially the Type Seven, which was the most widely used. However, you have to remember that the U-boat is, is supposed to withstand a lot of pressure when it's uh, operating at its des designated depth, which means that the pressure hull it uses a lot of strong steel, and in order to penetrate that repeatedly, you really have to, had to have a very strong gun. And this is precisely what the, what the 57mm was. And the best bit was that it could actually fire at 55 rounds per minute, which was about one, um, uh, one round per second, or thereabouts, um, and it could actually fire effectively from uh, at least one mile out, which gave it a bit of an advantage to the U-boats, which were progressively more heavily armed with 20mm cannons, anti-aircraft cannons, mounted on the conning tower and uh, th this way you could actually uh, ach achieve a very, very high hit rate uh, as far as I know the 57mm mounted on this plane actually had a 33% chance or one third of a chance to hit a tank sized target uh, from a mile away and that was actually huge compared to rockets, which um, the RP-3 rockets, uh, when used in combat, actually had a hit rate of about half a percent against the tank, tank sized targets. So this gives you an idea of how effective this weapon actually was. And although its service proved to be a bit short-lived, because as Bo said, the weapon was nearly as universal as the RP-3s. It was still a hell of a gun and a hell of a weapon, and also one of the reasons why I like the Mosquito so much, because it's so damn universal. It could do everything. And then there's one cannon we'll mention before we move on to the RP-3s that keep coming up is the 30mm uh, Aiden cannon. Um, if you want to talk about that real quick, Firefly. Yeah, well, let's make it real, real short and sweet. Uh, basically, the Germans have experimented with revolver cannons. Uh, by, the, by the end of the war, they actually had a working prototype called the Mauser MG213C. And that cannon was actually captured by the Allies, and then it's, the technology used to manufacture it was used extensively throughout the Western world. And you can see that the French Dafer cannon, the American M61, I think, and the British Aden cannon are all revolver cannons using the same operating principle as the MG213. And this is a cannon which fires a 30mm shell, which is roughly twice the weight of a 20mm shell from the Hispano, at a rate of fire of between 1,300 and 1,700 rounds per 
per minute, depending on the variant, with an acceptable muzzle velocity of about 750 rounds per minute. And you can probably imagine that a Hawker Hunter, which actually went into service in 1954, uh, with a pack of four of these guns, could tear apart through any target that found that was unfortunate enough to find itself in front of these guns. And this was actually a very lethal weapon that um, actually kept on in the service, I think, uh, until the 1990s. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I will have to check. But, I mean, the, it's a very long-lived weapon. And you can see that the Germans were clearly onto something with this. <coughs> All right. So, rockets. Okay, the RP-3s. <laughs> Simple enough. RP-3s were... I'm, of course, I'm American, so I'm pretty partial to the uh, American rockets, but the, I think the British showed us up a little bit with these RP-3s. These were in production sooner than the American rockets. And when I was research researching these things, the same thing keep coming to my head was, holy hell, these things have a lot of uh, firepower behind them. It has a 60-pound warhead, which uh, is essentially, from what I can find, what Peter described it as a, had the same firepower as a light cruiser uh, hitting something. Um, yeah. Well, the, essentially, the salvo of eight RP-3 rockets uh, provided that they had the biggest warheads available, which was about 60, fi uh, 60 pounds of high explosive, depending on the application, TNT or RDX. Um, eight of these rockets, you can probably imagine that the firepower would be about equal to the broadside of a cruiser. And the Typhoons, this is a weapon that was from everything I could see uh, from over the years of hearing about the planes, this is kind of the rocket that made the Typhoon famous because the Typhoon was... The Typhoon found its niche in air-to-ground attack, and the RP-3s, um, it was devastating. These things just basically flew low and hunted the crap out of German tanks and had a high success rate, higher than any of the... I guess we'll call them anti-tank gun aircrafts from the IL twos and the you know numerous other planes we've talked about through these podcasts. The uh, RP threes with the Typhoons or the other British planes that use these things had a very high uh, kill ratio. That's true. Although most of the kills that they've actually done was uh, against soft targets because in order to kill a tank you had to hit it directly. And as I said, the hit rate of uh, the RP-3 in combat uh, conditions was about half a percent. So essentially one rocket in 200 would hit a German tank. However, that wasn't the end of it, because if you think about it, you have a rocket which has 60 pounds of TNT strapped onto it, and you have, a, you know, three, four, I don't know, six planes flying towards you and firing all these things at you. The psychological impact of that is devastating and i mean devastating you would be afraid to leave your leave your bloody cellar for the next 3 days um, <laughs> if you were you know if you if you were subject to an air raid by by typhoons with these things things uh, strapped onto them and um, the thing about the rp3s was we have to remember uh, they most what they mostly did was they disrupted the German communication and logistics systems uh, in northern France. That was the single biggest achievement of the RP-3 rocket. Of course, it could be used against pretty much anything. Uh, tanks, guns, uh, ships, uh, you know, almost any aircraft in the British infantry was, uh, every aircraft in British infantry was actually qualified to have these on, and this actually pr serves to prove how amazingly versatile this weapon was. And although the numbers might not suggest, you know, how, how good it was, uh, well, ask any German soldier who was <laughs> present at the time in northern France uh, of what he felt about uh, rocket-equipped typhoons. And these things were very instrumental in the uh, Battle of the Bulge. The British did a hell of a job of keeping... There's The hard part, as I say this, is a lot of the focus of the Battle of the Bulge was the American units that were trapped around uh, Bastogne. But the Germans were breaking out left and right around the cities and were rushing to capture bridges and uh, kill off any support units and capture fuel and whatnot. And the Typhoons and the P-47s with their rockets did a massive job of just strafing these convoys and slowing them down and getting the change path and just, you know, buying time uh, for the rest of the Allies to mount the you know, counterattack that came in January. 
That is exactly true. Um, uh, but... And with that, I think we might have actually come to an end when it comes to weapons fired from fighters and well, twin engines. There's one thing I want to add real quick, because there's a lot of confusion in the game of what the difference is between a Spit-22 and a Spit-24. And I'd just like to show real quick, the main difference is, is the uh, rockets. Um, the Spit-22, as you can see, has six rockets on its wings. The 24 had a special mount that allowed it to hold the rockets in a vertical manner so you could fit two more on. To my knowledge, there might be some other minor changes, but that is the big change between the Spit-22 and the 24 was its ability to carry rockets. Um, the Spit-24s were post-war, so it took longer to get them out because of reduced funding. So the Spit-24 hit an induction late year of like two years later, so um, they, you know, they're built like one at a time, so... Well, the main difference between them was larger fuel capacity for the for, for the F-24, and uh, essentially they, they were very similar planes. Uh, both featured cutback rear fuselages and bubble canopies. Both uh, variants um, had the tail end of a supermarine spiteful with larger tail surfaces. Um, well, most of the Mark 22s, the initial ones, were actually built with the same tail surfaces as the Mark 14. And... Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, we're going to move on to the next topic, which is bombs. I haven't talked much about most countries' bombs, but I felt that we're probably going to spend a little while on this subject because the British um, did bombing, and they did bombing their own way. <laughs> and yeah. I'm pulling out some of the British bombers now. Uh, we're not going to try and start any fights or any try to start any controversies when we talk about this because the British did some very, we'll leave it as questionable things, um, to the German citizens, and we're not, you know, I guess I'd say condoning it, but the uh, British, the U.S. bombers, um, and I, got, I can't believe I forgot the name of it, the U.S. used a, what's the name of the American bombing site, Firefly? Uh, the Northern Bombing Site. That was a very accurate tool, and the U.S. was very proud of it, and it was actually kind of a secret, top secret thing, and that's why the U.S. could bomb very accurately during the day, and we had enough B-17s to, you know, the whole idea was just to keep hitting with millions and millions of B-17s and then bomb the crap out of everything accurately. The British had a different plan, which was to drop bombs at night, and they did this through several different ways. We're going to bring up the Mosquito again because there was something called the Pathfinders, and the Mosquitoes would use... Um, I guess, I don't want to get into huge, we could do a whole podcast about this stuff, but the Mosquitoes early on had a radar system, and I guess we'll talk about the OB, was it E or 3? Uh, well, we might talk about G, we might talk about OBO, we might talk about uh, the H2S. Well, the, the basic idea was is that they had two antennas, one like in southern England, one in northern England, and then they had usually an antenna on the Mosquito. And the idea is between those three points, you could figure out where you were uh, over Europe. And that's how they would know, where the Pathfinder would know where it is, and then when it hit the you know the, the coordinates of where it wanted, it would drop flares on the target, and then the Lancasters or Wellingtons or whatever would fly over and then bomb the different colored flares that was designated for their targets. That's true, and that's markedly improved the accuracy of uh, British bom night bombing, uh, which was, uh, well, quite frankly, appalling. Uh, as far as I remember, I don't re remember the exact figure, but I think about only about two or three percent of the bombs actually fell within two miles of the target, and that was uh, that was uh, scored as a hit. And it was much safer to fly at night, of course, too, for obvious reasons. Uh, well, it, not really. Uh, the, the thing is that the Germans have actually employed a very efficient uh, night fighting force, which was uh, which was devastatingly effective at some times. And the most, the overall effect was that uh, both to flak and night fighters, the Lancasters that flew in night missions actually had an attrition rate of about five percent, whereas the Mosquitoes, which were much much faster aircraft and were thus much more difficult to intercept, in particular during the night, um, had only had a loss rate of about half a percent. Oh, uh, wow. during any given sortie. So, uh, in that respect, the Mosquito was probably the, the single most effective bomber that the Allies had. But uh, then again, you know, most of the focus of these operations is on uh, planes like the Avro Lancaster and the Hanley Page Halifax and the Short Sterling. 
So we're going to real quickly talk about the different bombs that are in game and then the bombs that should be a game and then of course there's some that will never be in game but the British had an obsession with size. Yes, they did. <laughs> and there, you'll see on the bottom of the Wellington there's something called the you'll see this big drum looking thing it's a 4,000 pound bomb it's called the cookie. Um, yeah, and that is the smallest of all the cookies. <laughs> they, uh, they, they could be dropped from Wellingtons and Lancasters, and then the, they could also be modified to fit inside of mosquitoes, which I would find hilarious if War Thunder could actually add that, because I... <laughs> but anyway, um... Yeah, that, that would be hilarious. Um, yeah. I'd also like to see this from War Thunder, is that, uh, from everything I could read, the cookies, they had to tell the British pilots to fly above three to 6,000 feet when you drop these things, because it would blow up your aircraft and damage it from shrapnel and blast and I would kind of love that feature to be added in game to force the bomber pilots to be off the deck because I think it'd be hilarious if somebody dropped a cookie and then blew themselves up in the air um. that's true <laughs> well essentially the, the smallest cookie uh, the 4000 pound bomb uh, was a very dangerous weapon even for its own crew and there were stories about Lancaster crews, which were flying at about six to seven thousand feet, and dropped their cookies only to have their escape hatches blown <laughs> off by the blast. And that was supposed to be the safe altitude to be at when dropping a cookie. And then there's something else that was packaged with the cookies, which I'll have pictures of. Is they use these incendiary bombs. This is something like we won't go too much in detail. The, but the British love burning everything up, and they dropped these incendiary bombs that were typically packed with the cookies. So you had the huge ass explosion. And then they set everything on fire behind it. Um, well, it wasn't actually as simple as you say it was. The thing, the, the, the idea, the principal idea behind it was that the blockbuster bomb, uh, which was the official name of the cookie, uh, would tear down um, all the windows and uh, rooftops and all the other pieces of uh, actual heavy structures, such as you know, regular apartment buildings. And uh, then this would create drafts and a lot of air flowing in from one side to another. And then they would drop. Those small incendiary bombs, which weighed in between four to thirty pounds each, and uh, you, you, a Lancaster could carry hundreds of those things. And because the the air, well, the the the, the whole um, the whole atmosphere was so drafty uh, it, after the blockbuster bomb actually hit, in addition to the destruction it caused, uh, the incendiary bombs actually had uh, a huge potential of creating. Uh, a very heavy fire that was nigh on impossible to put out and this actually created a um, well okay let's put it this way a firestorm yeah. now the firestorm look it up on wikipedia if you have never heard about it uh, it's essentially it's a storm of fire as the name suggests that cannot be put out uh, and that is happens because of the currents and the pressures that happen uh, in the uh, well, in the right conditions, uh, creating and incinerating everything within it. Uh, you know, creating temperatures up to 4,000 degrees Celsius and essentially baking and incinerating everything in its path. So that was a particularly cruel way of treating the German civilians, uh, you know, as the city of Dresden was to find out later in the war. Uh, but this was not the only um, loadout that the Lancasters could carry. There were Plenty of pl plenty of loadouts, uh, mostly a mixture of cookies, uh, general purpose high explosive bombs weighing in between 500 and 1,000 pounds, and then uh, small bomb uh, canisters which uh, fitted uh, which which, which fitted, fitted all the uh, incendiary bombs. Yep, and the bombs that are not in game, which I don't know if they're planning on adding or not, but there's a 8,000 pound blockbuster and there's a 12,000 pound blockbuster. Those are essentially just cookies welded together, like multiple sections. Um, yeah. Then there was the Tall Boy, which I'll put a picture up of, which was also called the Earthquake Bomb. That was, I guess, the first uh, bunker buster bomb ever invented, um, designed yeah. to break into sub -pins. It was designed by Barnes Wallace, uh, the same engineer who actually designed the Bouncy Bomb. And uh, Barnes Wallace actually designed this to be effective against targets such as bunkers, uh, such as you know heavily reinforced concrete and so on. But the most, uh, the, the biggest claim to fame was actually sinking the battleship Tirpitz uh, in 1944, um, which was a huge success for the British engineering and, uh, and their war effort because the, the Tirpitz actually jeopardized uh, British and American actions in the North Atlantic and the, um, and, you know, en route to Murmansk with the convoys uh, just by being there. 
So that was a huge success, and this was its biggest claim to fame. However, that was not the biggest bomb that the British had in mind when they designed those things. Yep, the, uh, <laughs> the freaking, uh, I guess we'll wrap it up on the Grand Slam. Um, yep. 22,000 pound bomb. I'll put up a picture of that one as well. Um, I couldn't even, I'll have to dig around and see if there's actually some pictures of that thing going off. I couldn't imagine what 22,000 pounds of explosives look like. Uh, well, it's not essentially 22,000 pounds of explosive. Although the cookie was ba essentially a thin-walled ca casing with lots of explosive in it, a uh, 4,000-pound cookie had 3,000 pounds of uh, explosive uh, amatol in it. Um, the Grand Slam wasn't designed to to have as much high explosive potential. It was primarily designed to to literally punch through any amount of reinforced concrete uh, that was on site. So, for example, this was a this was uh, this was the only bomb, as far as I know, that the Allies possessed that was able to penetrate and destroy the U-boat pens that the Germans have actually built on uh, the western coast of France uh, on the Atlantic seaboard. And um, it weighed in at 22,000 pounds, but uh, it only carried about well, only carried <laughs> 9,000 pounds of Torpex. Um, so essentially this, it was a delayed action bomb that was first designed to punch through the concrete and then explode inside the structure causing as much havoc as it could. And I think on Wikipedia there's actually a very nice picture of uh, the Grand Slam uh, with a man in it to, uh, that, that helps you illustrate how big a, a, a carnage this could actually make. This is just beyond belief. This is a bomb, uh, and I think the Lancaster was the only plane that could actually carry this bomb, simply because it had a bomb bay large enough uh, that could uh, accommodate uh, could accommodate this bomb with special modifications. And I think that will wrap it up for us. I'd like to thank Firefly for taking the time to help us the past two weeks. Always a pleasure to join um, you. If you guys have any questions about uh, anything we mentioned today, or uh, if there's anything you think we missed, uh, please feel free to comment. Um, and next week I will be wrapping this series up with the Japanese tech tree. <laughs>